you know, I was just watching one of your other, um, one of the one of your other pieces. Oh, who did I talk to? Because I, because I chose. Uh, well, it was two of them. I, I was. Uh, you were talking to Peter Himmelman about all these esoteric creative things, I <laughs> and uh, and uh, and creative in the sense of creator, and uh, and then Ginger Lynn Allen. Uh, you're talking about sexuality and yeah. and so I wasn't expecting that I was I, I'm glad that we're well, just well, talking I'm very, I'm very multifaceted <laughs> <laughs> well I'm glad we're just talking and hanging out instead of yeah. you know yeah um, I've been you know, me promoting stuff I, well I know and I've been having a Julie listening party uh you know with with uh Divine Horseman's latest which we'll talk about which blew me away I I when I was first contacted to talk to you, obviously I jumped at the opportunity, but I thought it was, you know, re, you know, I talked to people who are releasing or re-releasing material from the past. And this new record just killed me from like the first snare pounding, you know? <laughs> and, yeah, and it's a real record. Yeah, it's a record. It's a record. You know, and it's on vinyl and it's uh um it it is amazing that it even happened because uh you know um it, it's we we broke up 33 years ago you know we we you know we busted up big time uh the band and the marriage and all that stuff but um it's amazing people change and they forget to tell you <laughs> uh, yeah. you know you change you 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 grow you accept you know uh people as they are and and uh the fact that maybe uh we should have been making music together um in the first place uh and not uh, you know cross the lines but that happens with a lot of artists <laughs> but you weren't <laughs> idle you weren't idle at all i mean you've been pretty uh active oh, since. yeah i haven't dropped a lick <laughs> I, I i still count okay so I was always, I actually, I was unknowingly unaware of you, but I realized that I had one of the Radio Tokyo records. Uh, it was a compilation, or it wasn't a compilation, it was just all these LA um, artists, um, including the Knitters, which is the reason why oh, I bought the, the record. The Little Sisters, you're talking about the Little Sisters project. Yeah. Yeah, and that's how I met Chris. Right. Actually, I had been singing, you know, sitting in with Top Jimmy and the Rhythm Pigs, and Gil T, the bass player, was introduced to me by, uh, was uh, we were introduced with Top Jimmy saying, "This is three hundred pounds of pure love, Gil T," you know. And I, uh, I actually have a Gil T story. When I moved to did. Austin in '93, I, I saw I took guitar lessons uh, with Evan Johns, who is who was a like he had a band called Evan Johns and the H Bombs. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and I in 1987, um, while I was in high school, I saw Dave Alvin and the All Nighters and Gil was with them. And and but Gil lived in Austin at that time, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. And he came over to Evan Johns' house and that that was as cool seeing him <laughs> as like if I was meeting Paul McCartney and I got high with him, it was so much fun. <laughs> I, and I remember I was like, what's your last name? He said, Isais, <laughs> you know? Yeah. He was just very yeah. cool. But not only that, and then also around that time, because I was so into X and there wasn't like, and I would like to get all the other peripheral stuff that I bought the soundtrack to that Allison Anders movie that I think you guys. Also yeah. We we were on with I think there were two things on on um, Border Radio I'm pretty sure one was they were you know just completely you know the uh, either end of the spectrum uh, one was this thing called Lily White Hands that was you know that had a fiddle on it and it was real introspective and quiet and and you know murder ballady and and the other one was Mother's Worry which was just Balls out, punk rock, you know. And my mother's worry, and it just, I remember <laughs> that so well. In a desperate hurry to get my story told. Yes. <laughs> I worked at Floorshine Shoes. 
was like my first like after school job and I was blasting that and the <laughs> boss got so mad at me he's like turn it off <laughs> but, no, but that's what it's it sort of explains you know you really you cast a wide net you know and, and I'll end like my little intro by saying that when I lived in LA uh, seeing you live was such a revelation. Not only a really great night because we all had dinner after with Krista. I think it's yeah, with Krista yeah. Fuller and her kids, uh, with Samantha and Samira and Tom yeah. and Peter, their neighbors. And it was just very cool uh, meeting you. But that performance just killed me. And I've worn out that record. It's biodegradable. So luckily. Which, which record? Right. But it's just, it's so that's what Which sort of, record was it that, that we were that I was uh playing stuff from on that on that gig was it weeds like us it was well that great song one more meteor oh okay so it was uh where the fireworks are my angry yes. anti-war record but it but it's still it's still relevant honestly yeah I mean I thought you know I made it in from 2005 to 2008 because I started it with a with a, a song uh, called I was calling it Independence Day, and I and, and it was this um, uh, maybe I told this story that night, but I'm going to tell it again since we're schmoozing. Um, I I started the song because I had gone to this coffee house to um, I was registering voters in 2004 and. Uh, there was this guy, this young guy, and I'm not shitting you. He, he was. Can I say that? We, we were. He was flirting with me, you know. And he was like robbing my rocking chair, you know. I wasn't, you know. He had the, he had the, uh, you know, one of those slouchy cowboy hats that was kind of popular then, you know. Yeah. And like the, the, the both ends came down. Yeah, I like this. His face, and he was about six foot four, and he was cute, and I get made me a little nervous. But I was thinking when I went home, you know, and I told Leonard this, I said, you know, there was this thing and, and you know, I was just so uh, flummoxed and I, and I went home and beat off and, and, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, because uh, that, you know, it was a kind of a nice thing to have happen. And, yeah. and, and I thought, God, this guy could actually go to Afghanistan. Yeah or to, you know, one of these places they're talking about going. And um, so the first line of the song was, between my thighs is all my country. That's a and magnificent thought, song. Huh? It's such a good That's song. A, oh, thank you. Well, I had to finish it myself because I called Leonard to, um, to see if he could help me out. Because I said, you're the only person who could give this enough weight, you know, and, and it not be a parody or a novelty song or something like that and he says well you got yourself into this darling you're gonna to have to get yourself out. yeah he's like you beat off alone i got to know him I for a him year he goes I, I i feel you i've done that before too <laughs> to was, start a song or whatever <laughs> i i asked him about you because i went to the same synagogue i was like i just met julie he said S thank you friend send her my best <laughs> uh, well but, she's he that was a big part of my um you know it i you know i was on the road with him six months after i got sober and uh you know he was very understanding about it there was a guy on the crew uh who i could hang out with and uh, the piano player you know it was sort of you know he didn't drink but you know, there were some other outside things going on, <laughs> like the roadie speed, you oh, know, yeah. but, but I didn't know this until, you know, much later, but anyway, it was a big part of me being in the world and knowing that you could be in the, I mean, it was such a fantastic time that 1988 tour. And, you know, we went everywhere. We went to San Sebastian, which is one of my favorite places I've been on earth. And I mean, we went all over, we had to go back to Scandinavia again because it was supposed to be like a four month tour, but in 88, we were on tour for, I think seven or eight months out of the year. We had a little break for a couple months or two in the summer. 
Did you look but, up any relatives? I did. did I you? tried to look up. <laughs> I tried to look up. Uh, I have a cousin named Peter Jensen. Okay. And that's like John Smith in Denmark. Right. So they couldn't get, they couldn't interview Leonard in Halsboro where we were, you know, you have the tech rehearsals where you're, you know, doing the dry runs, uh, the sort of dress rehearsals for the real gigs. And I don't even think we did a gig in Halsboro, but, uh, but, uh, and, and, you know, it, we were trying to sleep uh, because we had all had such jet lag. And uh, that's when it was confirmed for me that yes, Denmark is a nation of drunkards because they would be out, you know, in the, in the, you know, in my daytime, you know, in the, their middle of the night, just hollering in the streets and stuff, you know, and Ross Gilda Festival will also confirm it, you know, that. <laughs> who, arranged, who arranged the backup vocals for those songs, Leonard's songs? Um, it was, um, uh, oh, just, just to finish that other story. Oh, please, I sorry. About Peter Jensen. Um, so they, they couldn't get Leonard. So the little paper interviewed me and it was a terrible picture. I remember that they put up, but, uh, during the course of the interview, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find my cousin. He has a summer house up in Albar where my, all my family is from. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so, and they said, what's his name? And I said, Peter Jensen. So when the, when the article came out, it said in Danish, I'm looking for Peter Jensen, <laughs> you know, I just shot, you know, and so I, I would be in concert, you know, in Denmark somewhere or in Scandinavia somewhere and they would go, somebody would go, I'm Peter Jensen. <laughs> did, did you get in contact? I got in contact with his parents, uh, my father's second cousin, Esther. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I was staying with somebody in Copenhagen and, and uh, no, it was actually earlier than that. Anyway, I, I didn't get in touch with him that time. Uh, it was another time when I was in Europe. So if it's just a second cousin, emigration wasn't so ancient. I mean, you know, when your people came over, where was it to Iowa or Minnesota? They came, they came over to, yeah, that Manus, Magnus, my grandfather came over when he was about 26. And he had a couple brothers who had already come over. And, uh, and I've got his, I got his, one of the guys who was a promoter for uh, Leonard, you know, he's gone now, Patty, you felt he's just, he was just a dear. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he said he had a crush on me, on me in 1988. And, and so he was trying to help me um, in like 2016 to get a Danish passport because, or 2016 and 2017, because Trump was on the rise and stuff. Yeah, and I remember that. I get political, but yeah. um, a Danish passport is pretty sought after. And it, he said, well, I used to, you know, get visas for Bono and whoever was playing the Danish National Stadium, because I run that thing. And so uh, let's try to do it. And we got, they got my fingerprint, they got my signature, wow. they got, um, all our ducks were in a row and it was just about to press send and they changed their rules. Unreal. So, so yeah, my grandfather, I'm just one generation removed. Have you done your ancestry.com DNA? Oh yeah. Yeah. Mostly Germanic. I mean, my, it's just my name that is Danish. It's but, German on both sides. Wow. That's a, that's, that's interesting. I, I pegged you for uh, like a Viking descendant, although. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I am a Viking descendant. I, you okay, know, my, my, my second cousin told me that uh, we were uh, descended from Eric the Red, but then probably all Viking types are. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, my, yeah. my, 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 uh, my background, I was hoping for something interesting, but it was all uh, Ashkenazi Jew. And I've, well, always, I've always wanted to be, you know, if I'm Jewish, let me look more Jewish. Like, let me be more swarthy and dark haired, you know, yeah. no such, no such love. <laughs> right. You weren't, you, you weren't Sephardic then you weren't. Yeah. But yeah. my whole family, you know, are relatively dark haired and I mean, at least one side. So one of the things I was thinking about 
because I asked you about, and, and I guess Leonard has a lot to do with this because of the way the songs were arranged. And when I said you get a cut, cast a wide net, that was way different than anything you were probably doing in Divine Horseman or, or what would become your solo, uh, uh, your solo gig. It's, yeah, it's, it's really so. So t- take me up to LA the first time you got there, just like the early Julie years singing. Well, I um, I started singing in Iowa City uh, with a band called Longshot, and it was an apt name. I mean, I'm one. They, there were uh, seven or eight members. You know, we had two different steel players. Um, but it was seven on stage most of the time. And out of the seven, uh, five are gone. And one I think is institutionalized for PTSD. From being in the band or? The I escaped. Hmm? What, what, what was his piece? What, what was the PTSD to, uh, attributed to? It was our drummer. He, he uh, had been in NAM. Oh, wow. But our other drummer actually died of uh, alcoholism. Oh. And the, the main guitar player died of alcoholism. The um, uh, the guy who kind of ran things and was the piano player uh, went to jail for selling dope uh, to two people who died. And he had 40, 40 years, but he died in jail. Um, uh, did the band Al, Murphy, Al Murphy is still around. He's he's a fiddle player and he plays with um, um, uh, Greg Brown and some other people. And he he came out to my he had the roadie and the roadie has gone too <coughs> now. But the roadie Jerry and and uh, Al came out to a gig where I was promoting that um, Cardinal album, which I don't know if you've that's one of my favorite ones yep. that I've done because it is a little bit more I just missed rocking and I wanted to go back more to the you know what what I had come up with with Divine Horseman but anyway that okay I, I played with that band Long Shot and again I you know I got you know involved with somebody in the band <laughs> and it was the guitar player and we were like the Graham and Emmy Lou they were like a wannabe Burrito Brothers western swing band we warmed up for um, for John Prine, for Steve Goodman, for a sleep at the wheel. Uh, I, I worked a, a, as a waitress at our home bar. So uh, Duck's Breath Mystery Theater, who were my TAs at, at University of Iowa oh, really? you know, in English and drama and stuff. I still know Leon Martel. Um, it was really cool that at the bar that I played, it would be... Um, Coco Taylor one week, and then um, uh, Tony Williams Lifetime, you know, another weekend. And it was just really diverse and fun. And, and I just never, because it was the 70s, I never got the idea that you had to like wear your music like a flag mm. or, you know, or your girlfriend looked like your music, right. you know, or your boyfriend, whatever. What about Commander Cody? They, we actually saw them live huh. and, uh, you know, and I got recently to play with, damn it, I'm going to forget his name. Bill the guitar player. Bill oh. Curtin and his wife, Louise, was, yeah. Um, I hate when I remember, I forget names that, you know, I really should know. Like your name. As like, long as you know your own, yeah. <laughs> looks familiar, but, right, you know. Right. <laughs> so... Uh, so yeah, we saw Commander Cody during that time because we, I think it was at Summerfest in Milwaukee, because uh, we played Summerfest and Maria Moldar was there and, you know, that whole kind of San Francisco, um, Austin connection. And uh, I, I really liked being, it was how I cut my teeth in um, live music and we played a lot. We played the same um circuit that uh, Sean Colvin from the Dixie Diesels played. Um, <coughs> yep, Sean Colvin from the Dixie Diesels. That's that's how everybody knows her. And wasn't wasn't Buddy Miller in her band? Uh, at one time, I think he was. 
<coughs> but I met Buddy and Julie, and Julie broke my microphone. I had this really nice Electra voice microphone, and she borrowed it. And, you know, at that time, you know, there are a lot of us that used to be six sheets to the wind most of the time and don't remember what the hell is going on. So and that was at the point when they didn't remember, but now, of course, they do. <laughs> well, it sounds like if you're on tour with Longshot in the 70s, you were cutting your teeth, you know, at least chemically and alcoholically. Well, it was, you know, I had loved opiates. My mother is a, is a nurse, registered nurse. My father is a pharmacist, owned the corner pharmacy. She would do the uh, inventory, you know, and come home with one little bottle of mother's little helpers, you know, of all different, you know, Christmas trees and black beauties and disoxin and stuff. And she'd have another, and I knew what, cause I took inventory too right. at the store. So I knew what everything was too. And then another bottle, a, a, you know, half gallon jug of Quelladrine with codeine that they, you know, that they fill the bottles with. And so at, at 10, I would go, <coughs> I can't sleep. <laughs> So oh. when I found Longshot, uh, have you ever seen that movie, Jesus' Son? Not in a long time, but I know exactly. But, but it's the Dennis Johnson book of stories yeah. that didn't really succeed as a movie necessarily, but Billy, Billy Credit was great and uh, Samantha, whatever her name is. Mathis. Hmm? Mathis? No, Samantha, she's a... British or Australian actor. She's a, she was like the love interest. And anyway, Billy Crudup might've been, his character might've been an amalgamation of the guy I fell in love with, with Longshot and a couple of other people. Cause I met Dennis Johnson when my husband, who's an actor was doing some, uh, my current husband, the third of my Catholic damaged husbands. Um, he he was doing a show with uh, I think it was Arliss Howard and Ed Harris and and uh, Amy Madigan and Holly Hunter a bunch of people were reading Dennis Johnson stories so I met Dennis afterwards and I said I think I know these people in your stories about Iowa City I think I know some of these people I started naming names and he goes he goes yeah yeah I knew Snotlips and you know, Andy's brother and wow. you know and and I. I said, did, was Andy? He goes, yeah, Andy was my heroin dealer. Oh, so he was, he was, he was fixing as well. Huh? Yeah. Wow. It's pretty common, common knowledge. I, I, you know, Dennis is departed now and he was such a, John did some plays with him and, you know, he, he, he's the one, he got a, he got a, a national book award for Tree of Smoke and, um, which I read, it took a while to get into, but it's fantastic. Have you read that book? I haven't, I haven't, but it, I'll put it on my list because I do yeah. remember reading a short story in some kind of collection of, of, of short stories or I heard it read live somewhere, but I, I, I really like Dennis Johnson from the little yeah, I know about it. Great. And losing him and, and Sam Shepard in the, I think it was the same year or within a couple of years, to ALS, it was really, you know, it was really hard for my husband and, you know, as as um, nominally acquainted with him as I was. I mean, I got to work with Sam on this thing in 1996, this um, thing at the public theater mm. that John was doing and Daryl Larson, the director involved me with it. Um, so I got to actually work with him on something and it was just, it was just amazing, you know? And I'll tell you about that sometime when we're not. Uh, this it. has been the, you know, it, it's, it's been, uh, I mean, you mentioned Mother's Little Helper. I mean, Charlie Watts, I, I just read passed away. Just, I just came across my phone. Yeah. And I was thinking, you know, the Rolling Stones are starting to die. You know, this is, that's, that's not, you know, uh, that does not compute. No, listen, you know, I, I turned 50, I turned 50 this year and seeing my parents getting older and, you know, people leaving, dying, it, it's been so hard to, you know, wrap my head around it. I've got a 10 year old daughter 
And I'm thinking, like, I got to stick around a lot longer. Like, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, um, it's. John was 40 when we, over 40 when he had, when we had our kid, too. Oh, good. But yeah. So it, it, you know, it can be done. It, I was 37. Is that, um, so you, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a bit of a late start, but I'll tell you, Julie, you saw your voice on this, on the Divine Horseman, the new one is as strong as ever. I mean, and then when you mentioned the first line to uh, I think where the fireworks are, now <laughs> since and now since you explained it, now I know what you mean. <laughs> but man, I was like, that's a really good hook, but you know, you can't take it to radio. Right. You know, that's, you know for, <laughs> for the optimists out there, although I'm single, that is where the fireworks are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, come on. But, but I remember talking to you that night and you were, you did tell me a bunch of a bunch of things, one of which was, you know, you had mentioned that you knew v, uh, Via Mortensen because of the spoken word scene in L.A. Yeah. And, and I did the math. I was like, well, he was married to X scene. And so that world that, you know, Flesh Eaters and Divine Horsemen and X and all, I mean, you were really at ground zero of that. And how, yeah. how, how does like a, a, an Americana, or I hate that word, but a country, you know, hopeful, get out to LA where it's, it's like someone turned the color on? Well, I was, I was um, in Austin from 77 to 81. And I remember, um, you know, uh, the big boys and the dicks were playing at the hole in the wall. The same night I was doing like, cover stuff in a pink eyes on and khakis at some uh, uh, frat house. And we were doing things like, you know, the cars and, and uh, you know, that kind of stuff, like new wave or, you know, whatever was popular, big hair music that was popular at that time. And on, the, on my break, I went over to the hole in the wall. And the big boys and the dicks were playing there, you know, and it was Halloween night. so. Uh, I don't know his name from from uh, the big boys. Biscuit. Big fat guy. Huh? Biscuit. Biscuit. He's the Biscuit. nicest. He was the nicest guy. I lived in Austin I as well. <laughs> well, you know, people always wondered why I was with Chris D. And I said, well, you know, he doesn't allow him to be himself to be photographed with a smile on his face, and he's got a nice smile. You yeah. know, he's got. You know, he's a he's a sweet guy. And, um, uh, but, but anyway, B Biscuit was wearing tidy whities and a white, a blonde wig and, um, and uh, a, a nightgown, like a, like a silk woman's robe. And he pulled out this thing from his tidy whities that it was like a, a, a sanitary napkin with, you know, like red food dye on it and threw it into the audience. And I said, man, something's going on here what the hell you know wow. and i i had to the guy who runs yard dog have you ever been to yard dog in in austin it the sounds art. familiar i mean i was in it's the hole in the wall a lot well it's not on congress anymore because everything on congress has been bought out by rich people and yuppified yeah. but he um he was with this band called standing waves that isn't punk but it was there were, I mean, I missed Patti Smith coming through. I missed the Sex Pistols coming through Austin because I was doing jazz. I was singing jazz. And even though I was singing jazz, like Joey Lee sax player would come in to play with me or, or um, you know, the, the guys. This is how I met Leonard Cohen is I was singing jazz with Roscoe Beck and, and Steve Metter and Mitch Watkins. You know, was Ernie, they, did you know Ernie Jarawa, the drummer? Yes, I sure did. Yeah. And um, and I got to play with him at this um, uh, Doug Psalm tribute with Charlie Sexton and uh, Denny Freeman, God rest his soul. And and um, it was this thing at the at South by Southwest a few years ago. But we could go round and round. I'll tell you, I, I think I've been following round. you. I've been like, following your 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 trajectory, you know. Somehow I got to Austin, then I followed you to LA <laughs> without <laughs> well, even knowing it. But what was it like? Okay, so you get to LA because 
as I, and as I'd mentioned, I, re, I, I listened to Chris D's chapter the other day in this book about Los Angeles punk. And oh, it's Johnny Doe's book. Yeah. Under, under the big black sun yes. or the. It's my favorite chapter because it's really long and it's. It, <laughs> well, that, <laughs> we could talk about that too. I know, but, but, it, but it's it, like, it, it gives you the, I, it, it, he just, it's so self-effacing. And he's like, yeah. he, he even says something about, I even, I'm even grateful to my ex-father-in-law for not like hitting me when he saw me while he was moving, you know, uh, my wife's furniture out of the house. <laughs> well, he's a big guy. Yeah. But anyway, uh, you asked, I didn't answer the question of how I got to Los Angeles. You know, no, you know, those same guys who played with Leonard Cohen, Mitch and those guys would also play with Joe Ely or would play with uh, um, Brave Combo or, you know, whatever was rock and roll in that town <clears throat> because they could learn everything really fast and, and you know, cut the mustard. And this guy, Michael Brofsky, who was uh, part of a and at that time, was like the field, he had the field office for anything that was going on in Austin. And, uh, you know, I had been there, I had, you know, planted seeds. I, you know, we didn't even have answering machines back then for part of the time I was in Austin. We didn't have, you know, and somehow I was working all the time. I was doing studio work. I was doing happy hour and then I'd, you know, change my outfit and go play at some some cover gig or play with Beto y Los Fairlanes in their iteration that was um, uh, Dude Skiles and the Fabulous Fairmonts, you know, mm. at some highfalutin place in San Antonio. Wow. You know, and share bills with Steve Fromholtz. And, you know, so I was, you know, I thought that I was really making a splash and I was getting somewhere there. But I, if I called Michael Brofsky, who was the only game in town, he would confuse me with Eliza Gilkison, who was Lisa Gilkison at that time, mm -hmm. for about five minutes before he realized I was me and then he did the conversation. So, oh. you know, and, and mind you, I was, I, I, I did all that, you know, with, with uh, some kind of cocktail at all times. Mm -hmm. And in Austin, you know, I moved from the heroin cocktail to the cocaine cocktail because that was like a pipeline for um for cocaine and everybody somebody would hand you something where would you, you score would, like on the east side where would you go i didn't have to score my darling oh good tell me I, how it, it was all given to me i think i only bought cocaine <laughs> once i'm you talking know. about the heroin <laughs> oh the heroin when you know i uh like i said i was i was fucking the the uh dealer Oh, you know, long shot. <laughs> Not a bad and, idea. And I, you know, who was also Dennis Johnson's dealer, you know, so that, so I, anyway, you know, I, 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 I say when I uh, tell my story, I never was a prostitute, but I've slept with a connection, you know. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so. That's, a, so that's on your next record. That's a good lyric. <laughs> but, but Michael Brodsky was the only game in town didn't know who the hell I was. And I was like, I'm out of here. I finally go into LA. I went to LA in the summer of 1980 with my second Catholic damage, or my first Catholic damage husband, pardon me. And um, uh, he went with me and all the people from the Austin Sun were now the people at the LA Weekly, Ginger Farney, Michael Ventura, Bill Bentley, you know, uh, Carlene Brader, these were all people I knew from Austin. And they had this big house in Koreatown uh, near Third and Oxford. And so I went and visited them there. And I said, okay, I'm coming. If there's a room available, I'm coming. And my husband didn't want to have anything to do with LA. In fact, didn't want to have much to do with music and wouldn't come out to hear me sing because he felt like I was emotionally naked when I sang. Uh, so so yeah, he, he was really, jealous. Yeah. He was jealous of that. So I went to LA and I started sitting in with people like Eddie Zip, thanks to Bill Bentley, who I love. D 
dearly and we've known each other 40 some years now and still are in contact. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I sat in with Eddie Zip and I, I said, I was so audacious in those days. I said uh, to Eddie, I said, can I, can I sit in, um, you know, do a couple of blues tunes? He goes, well, can you sing, you know, in that, you know, New Orleans accent. I said, hell yes, I could sing. Why would I ask you, you know, to come up and, you know, and, and to fall flat on my face? Right, 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 right. So he, <laughs> so he got me up there. And man, uh, um, oh, who's the guy that, that hung out with um, Fred Tackett was on the thing, okay. you know, and he was, I don't know if you've read the Jimmy Webb book, but he's like, you know, part of that. What, Fred Tackett from Little Feet? From Little Feet? Yeah. And Bonnie Ray fans and stuff like that. He was on the, the you know, the gig. And so was yeah. Armando Campion and, and, um, and uh, Lee Thornburg and, and um, the sax player also from New Orleans, Len Fico, I think is his name. Anyway, so that was a pretty auspicious first place to sit in. And, uh, you know, I just called the, you know, you know, 12 bars in D, you know, whatever it was. And did that a couple of times. And I started getting work from Armando Campian, who was the bass player there, um, started getting me like casuals, you know. Did you know um, Hollywood Fats? No, you know, I never knew him. Did you know him? No, I, he's just, he was amazing. Uh, I think he passed, by the time I was, I, I heard about him by way of the blasters, because I know that oh, yeah. he, but I mean, ever since, I mean, he, really was something else um yeah. a big rotund gay jewish guy from from nebraska you know <laughs> his name was michael mann and really i'm a just i'm a huge fan but what did you did you ever play i'm sure you played with don heffington did you yes i did and i was i i'm not on facebook as much anymore now that i'm in the mountains the hamus mountains You're better off side of a mountain i just uh you know, I'm so present and I'm trying to remain in the awe and wonder of nature, you know. Um, Do it. And, uh, you know, but I've been working a lot. I have a little studio here um, that I can do, you know, I can do remote um, vocals um, and uh, anybody out there who needs something, just hit me mm -hmm. up. But um, I, uh, I, I, we've been connected with the, uh, Bodhimanda Zen Center here, because of Leonard, I met these people. In, in 92, when I was pregnant, um, the abbess, the current abbess of the place um, said, you know, come out and, you know, when, when, you, uh, when your child is born, come out to, uh, to Hamas. And I asked her where it was. She has twins who are about seven years older than my son and they've all kind of grown up together. <clears throat> And she, I said, where is it? And she said, well, it's outside of Albuquerque. And I said, well, I'm, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, why should I want to go to Albuquerque? And the reason is to come here. It's an hour and a half away. Right. And we've been coming for 25 years and we always threaten to move here. So I'm sorry that I made it about me. No, about it's all about you. Is, where is John from originally? Is he, is he a Midwesterner? I believe so, but I, but I don't know. I, I played with him a few times and I saw him at gigs. I went out to see the Watson family and, you know, this tribe of musicians. No, I'm, is, ta I'm talking about John, your husband. Oh, John, I'm yeah. sorry. I, I was, I just wanted to say about, about Don, Don. Yeah, he's an LA guy. Like the handsomest men in rock and yeah. a, an incredible player um, that I, I, you know, I got on Facebook one of the first few times that I had gotten on Facebook lately and it just crushed me you know, to see that that was, you know, because I didn't know he was sick. And anyway, so that was- friend really Chucky a few weeks ago, you know, Chuck Weiss passed. Chucky Weiss, he was always around when I was first in Hollywood. He might've been part of introducing me to um, Tony Gilkison and um, eventually I lived across the road. It's like I'm a zealot of yeah, underground ooh. rock and roll. You are uh, like nobody knows who I am, but I know all these people, you know, peripherally, peripherally, and um, uh, 
And Steve Berlin, you know, who's with the Flesh Eaters, when Los Lobos came to, we call it Shitty Winers in, uh, <laughs> in Nashville, because mm -hmm. I was living there for seven years. Oh, yeah. I went out and said hello to them. And Steve Berlin was going, to Dave Hidalgo and everybody else. You remember Julie from back in the day? It's like, oh yeah, she was a singer, man. She could sing, you know? <laughs> oh, that's so cool. David Hidalgo, <laughs> I actually went back stage uh, here in Chicago I, a couple of times, but I, I think I was, I was at least 20 pounds heavier and wearing a jacket. And they're like, and David Hidalgo said, hey guys, doesn't this guy look like Top Jimmy? pointing to me uh, yeah you would have and, and that was the greatest compliment at the time <laughs> oh man well, what, was, top, what was top jimmy like as a musician i mean i know that he was he's infamous but i've heard his recording see that guy had some swagger and could swing he was cool he was very cool and i used to go down to the basement at cafe de grand and hear him and gill and and the band and i Frankly, I'm not remembering who the rest of the band was, the drummer and everything. But again, I would go up and, you know, somebody would say, Bill, I think introduced me to them too. And would say, you know, why don't you go up and, and sing a song? And at that time, you know, like I, I had jazz chops. And anytime I wanted to sit in, I could call, I had a couple of, you know, turns that I could do, um, uh, blues turns, you know or um, like a slow one, a fast one, and maybe, you know, a teeny weeny bit that was a mambo. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, if I, so I, I wouldn't overstay my welcome. I would do just like. When do you feel as though you kind of came into your own as like, like where you might've felt like I'm nuanced now? Because obviously, you know, when I hear Julie Christensen on a recording, since let's say where the fireworks are, it, it's really consistent. It's great because you have those, you have that jazz sensibility, but you have this rock and roll grit, which, you know, when did you find that being born? Or was that in Austin? Was it before well, I that? Think, I think it wasn't until I got to LA and realized that, you know, punk or LA, the LA underground thing, you know, I, I, had, I had a gig the night the X and the, the Go-Go's and X played together. You know, Bill was going, you don't want to go see X and the Go-Go's? I said, I got a gig. Mm. I got to go sing, you know, uh, you know, the way we were for Republicans, you know, <laughs> you know, and make some dough. Oh, no. <laughs> I know. Did you ever were you stoned every time you had to do a gig like oh, that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But um, I met those people, all, all the people from punk rock and Chris, you know, and all the panoply of people who played on that um that country record the little sisters record yeah and i was able to put together chris said well let's do one with you and i actually did two one that didn't make the record and it was with all these people who were with kind of country and 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 rock and roots rock at that time and greg lees was one of them he was on that ver the version of almost persuaded that i did for that record and so I, I got the the message that everything cross pollinated at that time in underground music with the with the Paisley underground and you know cow punk or whatever you want to call it alternative country um, uh, which people started to do because the headbangers the skinheads were too you know rambunctious and nobody wanted to put up with that. And I'm sure you read that in John Doe's book too. That you I, know. I did, but but I got a sense of just even from Chris's chapter that it was anything but those knuckleheads that you just mentioned, like the skinheads and the headband. I mean, this was this was like kind of its own art rock scene. It that... was. I could do. I tell you what. I did a jazz gig at uh, Al's bar one time, and. And uh, Bob from, from uh, Thelonious Monster, Bob Forrest, came to the front of the stage and cried and cried. He, he was down there just crying, you know, which is my job description. I'm supposed, I, my job is to make you feel something or make you cry or, you know, I, I've only, I can count maybe a handful of songs that I'm proud of in that way that, you know, 
really, you know, I'm trying because I would rather sometimes sing other other songwriters stuff um, because um, I like I revere Bonnie Raitt and and Joe Ely who who have brought their friends music into the consciousness you know Butch Hancock and Jimmy Dale Gilmore and you know Eric Kaz or whoever would do those songs of you know the guy who wrote long long time and mm. you know that's how I heard that there were songwriters because I could get next to the the vocals. I mean, I appreciated Leonard's voice more than I appreciated Bob Dylan's voice. It took me a long time to get past Bob Dylan's voice to the songs. And I'm just, you know, I'm outing myself here. I know. You're not alone. But, I mean, <laughs> but, but, uh, and I, I mean, learned Leonard's after the, songs. After Jimmy Dale Gilmore, it's like you can't really talk about it. I mean, that guy's voice is. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, and Chris, get this, I'm, I'm putting out a record on my birthday on January 21st. Awesome. Of songs of my own, you know, of songs of Kevin Gordon. It's called 11 by Kevin, Songs of Kevin Gordon. And he wrote Down to the Well that he, he on his record, he sang it with Lucinda. But Todd Snyder and the hardworking Americans covered it. And But, I, you know, Kevin has this band that is so splanky and funky that I think people don't necessarily hear his songs. And he's like a poet more. He went to the writer's workshop at Iowa City at University of Iowa wow. for poetry. And he's been published in the Oxford American. I mean, this guy's a head. He's- I've, I've, never, I've never heard of him until just now. Oh. Well, you've, you've got to go down that rabbit hole now. I will. He's just amazing. And I'll send you the SoundCloud link to the, to the record that I made, but that's just coming off of, you know, singers who present a song like what we did in Hal Wilner's Came So Far for Beauty for Leonard's stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you had Nick Cave, Linda Thompson, you know, uh, the, the Wainwrights, mm -hmm. Rufus and his mom and her sisters, sister and, you know, his cousins and stuff and Martha Wainwright delivering these songs of Leonard's in a way that people hadn't um, heard before. And it was before Leonard went back out on tour, I think. He didn't go out until 2008 to get his money back. Um, I was amazed that Leonard was so, like I always had this vision of him always, you know, somewhere in Greece or wearing an Armani suit. And until like, you know, every week I'm, Walking you walking to my car, like next to him, and he's wearing sneakers, jeans, just <laughs> and, and, yeah. and he said the funniest stuff, you know. Um uh, talk, you just telling me like I just sit in Starbucks and stare at the really beautiful young girls. <laughs> and then another time we were talking about you know racism and anti-Semitism, and he said something like. And it was total sarcasm, but I told, I got it because it was so funny. Uh, he said, yeah, well, you know, everyone thinks Jews are racist motherfuckers. And I said, do you think so? He says, of course, I'm the biggest racist motherfucker in the world. He said that, but he so, winked as he said it. Yeah. He, I mean, he's very honest. You know, he, he really, you know, um, Sophie, uh, Sylvie, I'm sorry, I just stayed with my friend Sophie. Sylvie Simmons, when she wrote his book, she was talking about him brandishing a gun naked in Leaper's Fork. You know, <laughs> he's going to go get some frogs or something, you know, and he comes to the door, you know, for somebody in his uh, all together with brandishing a, uh, anyway. <laughs> and he, his, you know, his politics would surprise people but he doesn't talk about them like he doesn't wear them on his sleeve and he doesn't talk about them it w or he didn't. And, um, and it would surprise me that he wasn't just a, uh, you know, an old hippie, mm. you know, he, old, he, he predated the hippies. Huh? He predated the hippies. Oh yeah. <laughs> but he, I mean, he was just such a swell, honest, um, 
guy. I mean, he he just really was that Zen uh, thing of just being right where you are and going, well, you know, this is right where I am right now. Mm. You know, and then it makes sense that he would say something like that. And just because all of us are trying to navigate this, um, this uh, critical race theory or whatever you want to call it, remembering that, you know, it's, you know, somewhere, you know, like we, we just sold our house and, and came down here in October of last year. And I was like, oh, it's not a master bedroom. You know, uh, it's, you know, there, there are lots of things that are just really solid down in our core. You um, know, even my friend who, who um, stood in Nashville across the street from these guys and gals at the, at the uh, state house who wanted to keep up this Confederate statue. And she stood, I mean, she was there for like three months every day and night. I'm not kidding. Protecting it. Protecting, you know, protecting the Black Lives Matter side. She, you know, she went down there every night and we were in a, in a meeting once and, and she said, she said, I just feel so gypped by this. Oh yeah. Still by something. That. And, you know, and I hadn't heard that word in a long time and, and somebody pointed out in the chat Zoom and she said, oh, I, I realized it just as soon as it came out of my mouth, you know, we don't yeah. say that. We don't say that anymore because it's, it's about the gypsies and they aren't even gypsies anymore. They're Roma. Yeah. And, and so Romani. And, and um, so we're all in this thing together where we got to call ourselves out on it. You know? I agree. I, I, I have a problem with assigning racial you know designation because it, it comes from a good place but you have to think like that's what speaking of Roma and Jews and what the Nazis did you know they're it's unless we want to learn about the good aspects because I look at race and appropriation as a good thing in that we get the best out because there's so much great I mean there's so much great uh elements of every single race. And I, that's just how I yeah. focus on stuff. But like I wish friend, I was part of a tribe. Yeah. You know, I feel, I, I, I want to be, I, I went to a, um, uh, a, a guy, a Yaki Indian guy that I knew gave me a tip, you know, a sack of tobacco and a little amulet bag and stuff when I turned 50 and said, you're an elder now and you got to go down to the elder gathering in San Pedro and I went down and I took a sweat with a bunch of white uh, ex-con women, you know, and I started getting sick because I had eaten steak the day before. But oh. I, uh, I went to the historian's um, uh, booth and he said, well, what tribe are you from? And I said, I don't know, Viking tribe. And he goes, well, the Viking came, Vikings came as far as the Hopi lands. They did. And, you know, I, it really, he, he didn't, he didn't judge, he didn't say anything, you know, like, you know, I was the one being like sort of glib and stupid. Mm. And that, that really, you know, I felt really honored by that whole experience uh, from the amulet bag to the historian. And, uh, you know. And the shits. And the what? And the Schwitz, the steam. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, in the in the sweat lodge. Right. And so, so um, you know, I've been watching. I instead of watching your your other schmooze button things, oh. I watched about half an hour of your the like movie no? you produced. Oh, the, the, the documentary. Yeah, the thanks. documentary, and you know, just these people. It was wonderful hearing these people talk about, you know, I loved Germany and I loved, you know, growing up there and I had good friends and, and, you know, my parents had to take me aside and say, you know, we're Jewish. And, and uh, they didn't know what that meant. Mm. 
in a way. They didn't know that that meant that they were other then. Sure. You know, because you think when you're a kid, you're not. You're not. Until you have your own kids. Huh? I said, until I had my own kid, I mean, I, I understood things intellectually, but when you have a kid and you have to, and they're faced in like, like this wonderful woman, I think I forgot her, her name, Yomi Park, who's, who fled North Korea and, and, and is one of the, she's a human rights ambassador and she's not only beautiful, but so eloquent, but having her explain what it's like to be a child growing up in an evil type of environment, no different from kids who are trying to get into the Kabul airport. You know, it's, that's, that's the biggest crime is against children who didn't bring any of this about. No, no, it's, and, you know, and yet there's, there's been enough, you know, there's been some evolution, uh, this is this is not about race, but it's about you know our um, and it's not about politics. It's a private matter, like yeah. my mom used to tell me. But um, you know when the when well, uh, let me back up. Yeah. This is yeah. when at um, this is about politics and race. When uh, this little girl went with her mother to the uh, Obama inauguration. She, her, she said, mommy, why are you crying? Because this little girl had at that time, before things got, you know, I mean, things were bad, but not for even children and what you're seeing right. on television right. uh, with this, you know, racial war that's going on. She says, mommy, why are you crying? And you know, the mother was at a loss for words because her daughter couldn't know that, you know, that all this stuff had gone through for, for uh, black people and women, women of color, mm -hmm. you know, she, she wasn't aware because she just, it was like those little kids in Germany. It's like, they just- well, it'd be nice if her identity, it'd be nice worse. if her identity was attached to the progress and the triumphs, as opposed to if she's if she's of color, that I don't want that little girl to feel like she's a victim. You know what I mean? It's like I want them. Yeah. So so the mother, you know, obviously is not gonna, you know, it's like when you know, uh, somebody, some kid says, "Where did I come from, mommy?" And uh, oh no, I've got to I've got to tell the whole thing now you know my kid is seven and she's asking me where did I come from and so the mother goes through the whole explanation and she says no Susie's from Queens where am I from <laughs> that's a great story I, it's hilarious and my daughter my daughter is is very curious about that stuff and even stuff that I hear that she hears it's horrifying I've got to really I've got to toughen up <laughs> Yeah, my my son was uh, in sixth grade and he was kind of squiring his friend around Taylor. They just really liked to talk together. And, you know, he he took her to a, a movie one time and they, you know, so her mother, who is my good friend, lived up the street when I lived in Ojai, California. And um, <laughs> she called me up one time and she said, you know, I, I asked. I asked Jackson the other day, he's Magnus now, but at the time we called him Jackson. Mm. I asked Jackson the other day uh, if he talked what he knew about sex. And, uh, <laughs> and he told me, uh, I learned what I learned about sex from South Park. <laughs> and I was saying, Kim, can we still be friends? <laughs> Unbelievable. And I learned from Ginger Lynn. So that's probably why I wanted to interview. <laughs> from from stealing my friend's uh, father's video cassette, you know, okay. and, and tearing out and riding like hell home before my parents got home. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but here's the I'm going to successful. 
I'll successfully uh, tie this into Divine Horseman because, and to Christy, because there's such humor and absurdity and seriousness, all the great things you want to say about popular music. You know, I, I was listening to this. I was like, you know what? It's got everything that I love in Chuck Berry. There's roots, it's clever, there's humor, and it's just kind of gnarly at times, you know? Yeah, it's all gnarly. You know, love, sex, death, you know, the murder battle. I mean, it, it's kind of, when I decided to do that Cardinal record, um, it was because I was with a friend and he, he said, I played him, we were looking at stuff for licensing and I played him something, some Divine Horseman songs and his eyes got wide and he said, let's do some of that. And let's do your songs like that. Mm. Because really Divine Horseman was the first uh, iteration was the, um, the Time Stand Still on Enigma records. And it was all acoustic and it was this who's who of punk rock and you know whatever was happening at that time. I don't know if you would call it punk rock but because people from the Dream Syndicate, you know, Jeffrey Lee Pierce, Kid Congo, um, Bill Bateman played guitar on something. And it was, they were folk things. They were, you know, Frankie and Johnny and, and um, things that Chris was jumping off from James M. Kane and, uh, you know, construction, reconstruction era, you know, uh, tales of, of uh, you know, awful people and awful women and, <laughs> and uh, but it was folk music and it was, it was made into the, you know, sort of all country thing. And then when we started playing out, we were electric. And I think that core that, you know, the fact that we do kind of uh, music that would be folk and rock it out is, you know, at the core of the Divine Horseman deal. And you played Folk City. Hmm? Didn't you play Folk City in New York? With Divine Horseman? Yeah. Well, you know, my memory is sort of hazy about a lot of those Way things. in New York. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm not sure. You know, you may be right. <laughs> did, did you have a, is it, 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 when you get back together with somebody that you haven't performed or written or collaborated with in 33 years, um, aside from, you know, getting over whatever drove you, you all apart. You were married too at the time, right? We were married, yeah. But the, the, the third partner in that thing, and Chris is very open about this too, was the heroine. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that when, when and uh, it took 10 years for us to, you know, get in touch with one another again, because it took 10 years for, uh, for Chris to get sober. Mm -hmm. And uh, and now he's got decades just like I do, and uh, so there are a lot of it, there's a lot of forgiving that goes on with sobriety, and um, and there are still some things you know. Oh yeah, that was you know stuff that he doesn't like about me, and stuff I don't like about him. Just like in any friendship or or um, relationship, there are you know moments when you go, oh, yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons, okay. Mm -hmm. But we've, we've been pretty good at um, setting boundaries and, you know, um, not, we're doing this work together, you know, not, not getting caught up in, you know, I mean, we're personal, we're friendly. And, and I'm glad that we're doing this because it's, I think it's important, just like I thought it was important when we were doing it back then, I, I really felt like this was important work. And, uh, you know, so I'm really glad to be doing it again and bringing it. It sounds amazing, don't you think? Thank you. Don't you think? It's pretty great. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I'm thrilled. And we did it live, practically live. We had rehearsed up so much that we went in there and we did. Uh, six songs the first day and six songs the second day. And then I think there was a third day where we did some acoustic stuff and, and overdubs. And then we did overdubs at uh, Craig's house. Mm. Cause he had 
right when we were going to record, he had lost his lease on his studio in Gower Gulch or wherever that was. And uh, that's where the Flesh Eaters recorded. And I got to record in 2018 on that record. Um, that's yeah. a great record too. It's, I think it's a great record. I think both of these records are good and we're starting to work on our, our next one. <laughs> we're gonna try to get together in January if the world doesn't come to an end. No, I don't think it will. Yeah. I hope not. Cause I wanna see, I would love if you started, if you guys set up some Chicago dates or, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Did I hear some accordion on there? Yeah, my friend um, uh, Doug Lacey, who played on, I think it was, was it Devil's River? I don't know, but it was great. And Tell him played, I thought it was played. great. Oh, good. He, we sang together in Oingo Boingo, and we wow. sang in um, this uh, joint that uh, uh, Van Dyke Parks did with Gabby Moreno. And there's all these things, you know, like we were talking about, all these confluence this confluence of events comes together and people sure. and Gabby is, you know, I really enjoyed working with her. We went to Rothskilda and played and the is band. The was, huh? Who's, who is that? Is she the harpist or is she uh, from? No, no, she's the singer. She's, oh, she's amazing. Is she the Fleet Foxes person or part of that scene or something? Well, yeah, she, she, she kind of came up in the Luna Park deal. Gotcha. And uh, and she's from Guatemala, and she's just a sweet, wonderful human being, as well as being a badass singer and uh, writer. And uh, she's just great. So you got to go down the Gabby Moreno. I'm gonna. Uh, and and uh, but she and Van Dyke Parks did this immigrant thing. Um, uh, and I'm forgetting the name of it, but you can look that up. And Van Dyke. So Van Dyke and Gabby and 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 uh, uh, Doug Lacey had always worked with Van Dyke, and he's a piano player. We knew each other back from Oingo Boingo and playing with Divine Horseman, and so he's it's come full circle with that too. Doug's playing piano and accordion on this on that. I think you've got a memoir in here. I think you should write a book. Me? Yeah. Well, I'm I. I have a little more time on my hands sometimes, but it's amazing how you get out here in the middle of the boonies and I'm busier than I was in Nashville even. Good. It's, I'm busy all the time doing, I'm making another record with a friend who used to live on the same property as Christy and me. Really? And it's more jazzy. It's, I mean, I'm going to call it a jazz record, but it's, it's, it's just taking, you know, pop tunes and tunes that we love and, and uh, doing it. So it's, I can't, you know, that that's one thing, you know, you said that, that that after where the fireworks are, there was this kind of trajectory. And I really had to keep myself on task, you know, to try and uh, figure out what it was I was doing to play guitar and write songs on guitar and keep them simple mm. um, and straightforward. And I took a a songwriting class with Mary Gaucher, who's all about that. And her book is amazing. Are you aware of that book? No, I'm Saved. not. It's called Saved by a Song. Okay. And it's her story through these songs, you know, John Prine's song or John Lennon's song, but her songs. And it's just a fantastic book for anybody who writes or is a creator, or, you know, digs ditches. It doesn't matter if you want to heal, you know, with songs. What's what's the book called again? Saved by a song. Okay. I'm and gonna have so many I'm gonna have so many excuses to to have you back on my 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 little show because uh, you've got I'm all the products. I'm also a member of on and on and on and on. Say that again. I'm I'm a member of on and on and on and on. Yeah, I, I can really. Know, I've been to <laughs> meetings. I'm working the I'm working the steps. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, I qualify for lots of those things. <laughs> well, this was so much fun. I was so looking forward to talking to you, and, and it has all, you know, it exceeded my expectations. But I, I do. Let's stay in touch. And yeah, let's stay in touch. And I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we got to talk about my life starring me. But the hot rise of an ice cream phoenix record is 
what sent you to me this time around. And that's the, the Divine Horseman record that comes and, out. And it's fantastic. You know, I, I could be really boring and talk about, okay, let's talk about John's bass line, John Doe, you know, on something. <laughs> it's, it's a great record. Everyone should go out and get it. And oh, it, it's not permanent playing on that one. John Doe did play on um, Flesh Eaters, but it's, it's okay. our, our friend Bobby Permanent is the, is the bass player on Divine Horseman. Who was your band when you played the, the time that I saw you at Genghis Khan? Because it was just this great little, it was just a great little ensemble. I don't know who the bass player was, but he looked really cool. And I remember they were reading yeah, the I charts. Have, he was, yeah, that would have been, it probably was uh, Steve Nelson. Mm. Steve Nelson. Who, who does works in movies and stuff now too. So it was great that I got him to do it. And, and it also seems like there was another time I played at Genghis with Butch Norton, who is uh, Lucinda's drummer, but that was with another, the next album. So who would it have been? I don't think I had a drummer that night. I think you did. I did? You had a full band. Okay. Yeah. So it would have been Tom Lackner from Santa Barbara and a guitar player named Joe Woodard also from Santa Barbara. That was fun. Well, Julie, yeah. I, let's, uh, I'm going to, I'll send you a copy of the, of the interview as soon as I edit, but this was great. And I'm, I, you know, I think you're the coolest and I've been oh, following you, ever, cool. and, you know, apparently since I'm in high school, but um, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure. And the, the stuff that you're, putting out now is is relevant it sounds amazing and whoever is like engineering the stuff it's like these it really pops it's fantastic especially yeah, Craig Parker Adams I'm going to put a shout out to please Craig, um because he's you know he did the flesh eaters record too he's just great and my mastering engineer who I turned Chris on to um uh Mark Chalecki from Little Red Book Mastering he has worked on, all, you know, all my recent records and I trust him so much. I just send it out to him and we'll go back and forth online about it. But the Kevin Gordon record is mastered by him too. And he was really fastidious about it. And it's in vinyl too. It's double vinyl. Oh, uh, Kevin, cool. Kevin, Kevin uh, songs of Kevin Gordon and uh, my same band who played on the Cardinal and a sad clown um, played on that. And we did it all, a lot of, a lot of it remotely. And when we got together, it was in a big barn and safely and stuff. So during the pandemic, I moved cross country and made a freaking record. Awesome. <laughs> you are, so, but you're a true Viking. You're so, you're, you're so fun to talk with. Would, do you think Chris, would Chris, thank you, likewise, would Chris talk to me or is he kind of like not into it? Oh, no, he's into, he's into schmooze fests. Okay, cool, cool. I, you know, I'd be happy to have the two of you on, but... Uh, it, I think we'd all talk over it, and I just want to hear him talk. I'm, I'm sorry if I talked over you. No, but. hell no. But we'll do it again because I, I want, I, this was a blast. I actually had a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, me too. All right. And as far as Chris um, coming, I think he had another interview today. And to, he doesn't like the Zoom thing. That I don't much. blame him. It's, so It's all we got. And he, but he's starting to be more set up. He has a little more RAM in his computer. Oh, cool. You know, his his digital infrastructure is getting better. Getting some more RAM. All right, Julie. <laughs> have a, listen, have a great rest of the week. And, you too. And we'll talk soon, okay? Okay, Steve. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks, darling. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.